you turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter as we're in this series called Travelers Tips to Saints. Man, with everything going on in the world today, right? Here we are in the book of 1 Peter. And it lets us know that we really are traveling through this world. And uh, just a quick show of hands for those that are here this morning. How many of you can tell time is getting closer, right? And we want to be faithful to the very end for our Lord and for the cause of the kingdom. And so this morning I want to talk to you. Now we've come through quite a few things. I'm not going to do a total review on everything this morning. But I want to talk to you now, this next stage, I want to talk to you about this in the book of 1 Peter. You see, it, it lines up the book of 1 Peter from chapter 1 to chapter 2 to chapter 3 this morning. Matter of fact, last week we ended up in the, in the first two verses of chapter 4. And so we're in chapter 4 today. And everything has been methodical and systematic is God telling his people how to live in a world they no longer belong in. Now, if there's any part of your heart that tugs at that and says, well, I really do, something's wrong. Because the Lord said, blessed are they that long for the coming of the Lord. And we're supposed to long for that day when he appears. And our hearts should be more heavenward than here. And so as we go now into the book of 1 Peter chapter 4, I want to start in verse 3 this morning, and I want to talk to you about the old life. We're going to encapsulate the new life and the future life. Heavenly Father, we come to your throne this morning. Thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us, a day created by our Father. And Lord, we thank you that you're in control of things. And Lord, as we look at this every Sunday, we pray you'd help us to realize that as crazy as it would sound to the world, this world is not our home anymore. Right. We live here, we have addresses, we take mail at those addresses, but really, Lord, our home is in heaven with you. And it's so important, Father, for us to have books like 1 Peter to remind us where we really belong where we're really a citizen of, whom we really serve. And so, Father, as we come into this today to talk about the old life, the new life, and the future life, we pray that you'd be with us in our presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's start reading in verse 3. And I want you to underline the time past of our life. So it goes like this, for the time past of our life, may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about before we were saved. The will of our person and the will of the world that we lived in. When we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right speaking evil of you. There's people who think you're crazy. You got out of bed this morning, you made sandwiches for the picnic, and here you are now when you could be sleeping in on a day off. Well, don't let the influence of the world tell you what's right, because we live somewhere else. And the Bible goes on for, uh, the Bible says, who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. And that just simply means many of them that were martyred, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. I love that. Be ye therefore sober, watch unto prayer, and above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. All right? So let's understand our text this morning. It goes on a little bit more. We'll cover some of that as we go on. But what Peter's saying is that far too much time, when you count your days from beginning to what only God knows will be the end, far too much of your time has been spent in worldly practices 
And when you look at it as a whole, very little time is left in your life. That's a reality. And it's so important that we use the remaining time that we have to serve God. I, it gets real tense here, I, I know. Let me just say this, guys. Nothing else you do the rest of your life is going to matter in eternity but what you do for God. Fact. The Lord said someday he's going to say, hey, give an account of your stewardship. And someday we're going to give an account to God for what we did. Now, I'm one of those guys, I take that real seriously. We should all take that seriously about the time that we have in this life to serve God and everything that we do. We should take that very seriously. Now, I can't say enough about that, all right? Peter categorizes our old life before Christ, and, and he just listed these things, lasciviousness. And I know that's a hard word sometimes to pronounce, especially if you've got a little bit of a list, okay? But it's the doing of sexual sins of any kind. So we live in a world that accepts all kinds of sexual sin today. Now you think, wow, we jumped way back in time, preacher. And I think, well, what's wrong with the church that it doesn't preach on sin anymore? Right? Sexual sin is still abominable to God. And we should live morally before the Lord. And lust, that's immorality, the thinking of sexual sins, that's pornography, that's all those things that uh, we were involved in, and it should be this way, we were involved in before we were saved, okay? The excess of wine. Now that's, and I could, <laughs> I could preach a whole series on that. The wine we have today is not the wine the Lord was talking about in the Bible. You would have to drink all day long in the Bible to have an equivalent of a shot today. And that's why he said, hey, listen, don't tarry at the wine. It was totally different. And uh, revelings, wild parties, things that we used to be involved in, banquetings, uh, carousing, evil associations of fellowship. And this has become a difficult one today, isn't it? It seems like everybody around us is. And abominable idolatries, the worship of the wrong things and the wrong practices. What is worship? If I were to ask you today, take out a pen, paper, and write down, what is worship? You'd be surprised at some of the answers. But worship is when we place something before ourself, above ourself, and includes ourself. When we put ourselves before what God wants. So this encompasses a lot. All right. In other words, in time past, you lived according to the standards and practices of this world. You lived according to your desires. And he says that old chapter is closed and that door is shut. No. Scares me when you get this quiet. That time is past. That word there in the Greek is chronos and it refers to it was prior to the beginning. It was prior to the beginning. In other words, the day that you were reborn, the Bible tells us that he created a new man and a new woman. And boy, I mean, you just need to really go through God's word and, and look at all the different things God has to say about you being new. You're new in Christ. If you have the spirit of the Lord, and I brought this up a couple of weeks ago, think about how powerful the Lord's resurrection was, right? Think about that. It was so powerful. His resurrection was so powerful that a lot of other people got up out of the grave and went with him. Is that power, right? And in the early stage of the church, remember there, Peter, he would just, because that power was there and they were so in tune with the Lord, he would walk by and his shadow would heal people, handkerchiefs would heal people, passed around from them and you're just looking at wow yeah. you're a new man and you need to surrender to the new man and the new woman 
that God wants you to be. I know some people find it difficult at many times to do different things for the Lord. And I say, here's the psychologist. Why is it difficult? <laughs> Let's just write that down. But when we put God first, right? But now, now that you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, sanctified by His righteousness and, and, and made righteous, born again, made alive, quickened, can I go on? Made to sit in heavenly places as saints of God, adopted as sons and daughters of the God of all universes, made into the image of His Son, and made to rule and reign for all eternity, and I could go on with 50 others here. Chosen generation, royal priesthood, conquerors, yea, more than conquerors, lively, the Lord said. And we could just go on and on and on. God, God just painted this wonderful picture trying to get you to wake up and realize what he really gave you and who you really are. He's saying enough of your precious life precious life's been wasted time short in respect to how much time is left in your physical life and how short the time is before Christ's return. I, I got to tell you, these days, I go to bed and I know that there, you, you're going to look at me like I'm crazy and just let me just jump to it. I am crazy. I know I am. I wrestle with it myself at times. Every night I go to bed, I think, is this the night? Yeah. Is this the night? Sometimes my wife and I are sitting there in the evening and you hear a sound and you look and go, is it, is it upon us? That's how imminent I feel the return of Christ is. Now I'm telling you guys, we ought to be looking forward to that. Okay? So first of all, this morning I want to give you this. What you need to learn is that you need to remember that the past is done. You say, what do you bring that up, preacher? You just got through talking about that. Well, let me say this. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. It's a time that's past that can never be regained. So many of us as Christians, if we're not careful, I know I wrestle with this at times, we look back wishing we could regain some of the past. Now, that's a dreamer. But here's the reality. That's reality in the future. The present. That's the reality of it, all right? Leave the past in the past. And that includes your failures. That includes the things that you did wrong. That includes the things that Satan haunts you with today. That includes the guilt that comes with it. The sense of failure or whatever your parents told you that scarred you. That, that includes all those things. Leave the past in the past. Jesus said it this way. In Luke 9, 62, he said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now we read through that and we go, yeah, that's right. But until you've seen that in an agricultural setting, you'll never understand that. And so when you're plowing a furrow, when you're plowing there to come back and plant seed, but you keep looking, guess where your line goes? All over the place. And so he said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Someone once said, to make that, to illustrate that truth, don't stumble over something behind you. Now, one of my sons had this notorious habit of always looking back where he was go, where he'd come from and hitting his head or stumbling over something in front of him. He was notorious for it. And so when he was a young boy, every time we'd turn around just in time to see him looking back behind him, and stumbling over what was or hitting something with his head it was incredible i remember one night they're coming up it's a little dark they're just a few houses down they're coming down i said hey i stepped out to meet them so they'd know i was there and uh my son comes running up through there a dog barked and it scared him 
and like any child he takes off running but he's looking back at the dog behind the fence <laughs> and he falls down three times and gets back up and keeps looking at the dog behind the fence right we're products of our past but we don't have to be prisoners of our past The past can only be changed to the degree that you live in the present. Don't fall into the trap the past brings with it of guilt, sorrow, depression, and loss of confidence. Bill Keene said this. He was the guy, he was a cartoonist. He used to write Family Circle. Anybody in here ever hear of Family Circle? Raise your hand. There, there, there. And so... He used to write that, and he, he had a tremendous quote about that. He said, yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift of God, and that's why we call it a present. I thought that was pretty good, right? It's called the present because it's a present. Your past doesn't define who you are. So remember, the rearview mirror is small. But the windscreen's big. Where you're headed is much more important than what you've left behind. We need to get that down in our Christianity. We need to understand that. The past is a record of evidence. Now, I bring up the past for this reason. It's evidence of how willing we were to serve ourselves. Amen? And let the record in heaven show that from the point I got saved, I was more willing to serve him than myself. Let my testimony of before salvation be overshadowed by the testimony of my salvation. And don't expect your friends to understand. I, I just got to throw that one in. Don't expect your friends to understand your passion for the Lord. I mean, you'll be there forever. The whole world is trying to manipulate those that don't think the way that they do. In other words, where they go, what they do, what they say, how they dress, and everything else, and trying to make us feel like we're a minority. We are a minority. The Lord spelled that out. He said, few there be that enter therein. He was real up, up front about it. And we need to get that down. Don't let it bother you that's your minority okay I look at it this way we're clued in we're clued in you say is that arrogance no it's the Bible <laughs> the Bible clued us in all right and say and then live fervently because time's running out and that you know that word fervently there transliterated means overflowing and it represents this like a tide that's coming in how many of you have ever been in that much of swift moving water oh yeah come here just a second come here just a second you two men <laughs> Come here just a second. Big, strong, strapping guy, right? Look at these guys. Look at the one there that can't get up. <laughs> Can you stand up in it? Can you stand up in it? Thank you, gentlemen. I'm big, but it's around the waist. These guys are big. It's around the shoulders and chest. And I'm going to tell you something. If you have never experienced water that deep that you can't stand up in, you've not experienced swift water. The power of water. And so, guys, I'm, I'm going to say this like a tide that is coming in. So, first of all, remember, the past is done. Finito. Over. Yeah. Secondly, only what we do in the present will matter.
The past will torture you if it can keep your face turned backward. But only what we do in the present will matter. And that's why Peter says in verse 5 through 7, Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? You see the quick there? That's the same. The quick and the dead. For this, for, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. So let's look at this through God's eyes for just a second, all right? So the Lord, when we got saved, he made us a new creature. Are you with me? Yeah. Just let me see a few hands and I'll know that you're with me. Okay. And then he gave you this armor. Is that right? Yeah. And then he told you that you were in a battle and against Satan and that we had an enemy that's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And then the Lord told us that we were to pray without ceasing. And then the Lord, are you getting the picture that God sees when he looks at us, what he equipped us to do? He prepared us for a warfare and we just see, boy, I like being a Christian. God's saying, hey, this thing's real. And be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. We need to remember time short. Say not ye, John 4.35 says, there are yet four months and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. I'm not trying to be an end of the world guy, but clearly, biblically, time is short. And your physical life is short. I could give you illustration after illustration of people that I've talked with. <laughs> no one's gonna to wanna to talk to me when I tell them the story. <laughs> and next day I get a phone call and they say they died. They perished. And if you have any length of years on you, you've experienced that. Or someone you saw last week and they call you and they say, they perished. They're no longer with us. What do you mean? I mean, they died. And you're in shock. Man, there's nothing permanent about this lifetime. Eternity is near, not just for you, but for all the people that you know. Eternity is near, and we need to do everything that we can. We need to help make a difference now. And don't let the visible results tell the story. I struggle with I say that because I do a lot of times as a preacher. Everybody knows who Robert Louis Stevenson is. He said, don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds you plant. I came across a story several years ago. I put it in my files, and it's the most applicable that I can give you right now, a true story. A pastor was writing, and he said, I was reading of a missionary last, last night who spent 30 years in the Sudan without more than a handful of converts. He died on his field thinking he was a failure. But within a few years after his death, conflict came to that region and people started remembering what he had taught. And in the next 20 years, over 30 churches came about as a direct result of his ministry. You keep telling people no matter how they respond, because when the conflict comes, They'll remember who had the truth. That's how it works. Keep telling them. They'll say, I don't want to hear about it anymore. And one day, one day when things happen and they can see it starting to happen clearly, they'll go, well, what was it that guy was telling us about? Didn't he talk about this? You keep telling them. Number one, because it's a, here's a today word. It's a mandate. <laughs> and number three, the future should be our mark. He says this in verse 8 through 10, and above all things, 
Well, that's pretty clear. <laughs> Have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Did, did, did you see the part about minister? We're all in the ministry. All of us are ministers. Everything in life screams this message. Your health tells you to prepare for your future. Your finance, prepare for your future. Your children, preparing them for the future. Your legacy, how you'll want people to look back and remember you. I'll be lucky if I have 30 people at my funeral. But they'll remember this. They'll remember a guy that loved them and preached to them with a passion for the Lord. God's Word teaches us this is true spiritually. Did you know that? Someday there's going to be an accounting and God considers us stewards of the time and the talents he's given us while traveling here. You know, <clears throat> there are preachers I love to listen to. But you know what I figured out a long time ago? I'm not them. I love to listen to Charles Stanley. But here's why I'm not him. Because I would say, I ain't him. <laughs> I'm Dalton Walker, and that's what I got to give an account of in heaven someday. And the talents that I have, I have to give an accounting of those someday. Guess what? What you have, you're going to give an account of to God. Let me let me tell you how that's going to go in my mind. I was talking to my wife about this the other day. I said it's going to be like this. Everybody thinks they're just going to greet the Lord, give Him a big hug. That's all good. Can I say this to you? Most people didn't greet the Lord that way. In the heavenly scenes and here on earth, they fell down before his face. And so I'm thinking, I'm probably going to fall on my face. And I'm probably going to hear what the Bible say, a voice as many waters. You know what that voice is? A voice you can't speak over. And he's going to say something like this. Oh, there it is. Give an account of thy stewardship. I really believe that. Do I believe all the greetings will be there, enter in, you know, well done. That's what I strive for. Everybody else should. Thou good and faithful servant. That's what we should all be striving for, right? Doesn't mean we're going to hit that mark. We're striving for it. But there's also going to be that part about give an account of thy stewardship. Yeah. Above all, fervently love each other. Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth all sins. And then witnessing and winning others to Christ. I'm going to give you two more verses and we'll close. James 5, 20. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? Tell people about Christ. <clears throat> Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about God. Tell them about the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid to. People need to know. And in that night or that time or that hour, or that weekend that something happens in their life you may not know but they may bow their head and say oh God they were right please forgive me and that person's life of sin will be hid from God for all eternity I love that part I love that God teaches us that in the day of judgment, <clears throat> the judgment for our works, 
that those two things matter to him above all. And use your time to pray. How much should I pray? Without ceasing. Y'all ever struggle with that verse? That's a deep verse. It just says, pray without ceasing. So what does that mean? I'm on my knees 24 hours a day. Can I tell you what that looks like to me? That means this, that all through the day, no matter what you're doing, you're aware of the presence of God. And he speaks to you. And you're going to develop this with him. As you go along, the more you will just be aware of his presence, because he's there, right? I'll never leave thee, I'll never forsake thee. He's there. He indwells us when we're saved, right? And when we can get tuned in to being aware that he is there like another person in the room or driving down the road in the car or walking down the street or some different room that you walk to in your house or out to do the laundry or whatever and you're aware of that, you're going to find this. You're going to find those golden moments where you're going to sound like an idiot and I run to my wife and say, Paulie, the Lord just spoke to me. Not audibly, but in your heart. You're going to hear him give you something you've been struggling with for a long time and help you understand it. And you're going to be saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for helping me understand that that I've tried to for so long, God. Thank you for finally showing me that in your word and helping me connect the scriptures on it, Lord. And you're talking to him. You know what the Bible calls that? Prayer. That you're constantly having a dialogue with the Lord. Now, you don't want to walk in front of a hospital or psychiatrist's office and be doing that, all right? A little bit of humor. A little bit. But you understand what I'm saying. You've got to come to that place in your life where you're praying without ceasing. You're always focused on the fact the Lord is there with you. And I'll tell you what will happen. Like in that resurrection, his passion will rub off on you. His committedness, his willing to sacrifice, and his love for the Father will rub off on you too. And Christianity will never seem difficult for you. Pray without ceasing. Heavenly Father, we come to your throne this morning. I thank you for the great privilege it is to gather in your name and to preach your word. And Lord, to be clued in to know your Son as our Savior. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone listening to me this morning that hasn't been living that life that God wants them to have, Lord, they'd make it right with you today. Lord, they'd begin to practice that presence of Jesus Christ in their life. And Lord, if they're not saved, that today they would bow their head. I'd ask you to forgive them. Repent of their sins and ask you into their heart. Lord, we love you with all that we have because all that we have is yours because you gave us all that heaven had through Jesus. And it's in his mighty and precious name we ask it today. Amen.